In this video, we're going to discuss naming cyclic and bicyclic alkanes, compounds that contain at least one chain of saturated carbon atoms. So a cycloalkane is kind of like a linear alkane with the two ends tied together with the loss of two hydrogens. When the longest contiguous chain in one of these compounds is a ring, then we consider the cycloalkane the parent chain and name accordingly, putting the prefix cyclo before the name of the acyclic linear alkane with the same number of carbons. So for instance, the three carbon example is cyclopropane, four carbons we have cyclobutane, and five carbons we have cyclopentane. And although these are typically drawn in these sort of um, nice polygon looking forms, as we'll see a bit later when you get to cyclobutane and larger, the molecular shapes in three dimensions don't quite look like this. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. When the cycloalkane is linked to a longer chain, we can name the cyclic group as a cycloalkyl substituent. So for example here, we can talk about one cyclopropyl butane, where the parent chain is a four carbon butane, and the cyclopropyl group is a three carbon cyclic substituent linked to carbon one of the butane. In this case on the left, the six membered ring is larger than the three carbon linear fragment here. And so this three carbon fragment is considered a propyl substituent and cyclohexane, the six carbon cyclic alkane is considered the parent chain. Aside from these two quirks, really, naming cycloalkanes is exactly the same as naming alkanes. We just append this prefix cyclo to refer to the cyclic part of the structure. Now, polycyclic compounds get more interesting. Here we have multiple rings. And most interesting to us are actually bicyclic compounds. This is a typo, I should say bicyclic compounds with two rings. When you get to more than two rings, naming gets really complicated and we don't wanna get in, into the weeds on that. And so we're um, gonna focus here on bicyclic compounds and naming bicyclic compounds. Now, when we talk about bicyclic alkanes in which there are multiple carbocyclic rings containing carbons, there are three ways that multiple rings can be sort of involved with each other in organic structures. They can be sharing one carbon, two carbons, or three or more carbons. If they're not sharing at least one carbon, then we just name those two rings completely separately. But if they're sharing one carbon, we refer to that as a spiro or spiro situation. And to give you an example of that, that's gonna look something like this with this carbon here being shared between the six membered ring here and the five membered ring here. This is a spiro bicyclic system. A fused bicyclic system involves two rings sharing a bond and the two carbons on either end of that bond. So here, for example, we have a fused ring system in which this bond highlighted in purple is shared between the two rings. It looks like the rings are fused together. That's why this is called a fused situation. And when we have three or more carbons being shared between the rings, we've got a bridged situation. So here, for instance, we have these two carbons highlighted in orange that are shared between the five-membered ring here, that's one ring, and the five-membered ring here. And we also have this carbon that's shared between the two rings. And so what's highlighted in purple here looks like a bridge between the two ends of this sort of outer larger six-membered ring. So this is a bicyclic compound because it contains two five-membered rings in its structure. There's one and there's another one. But it's a bridged system because there are three carbons shared between um, the two rings, the two five-membered rings. These two carbons on the outside at the ends of the bridge are referred to as the bridge head carbons, kind of like the start and end of the bridge. Right? And we can think of these cl pretty clearly as bridgehead carbons. You can also think of the two carbons involved in a fusing bond as bridgeheads in a sense. This is just a bridge of length zero. And actually, this is important for the naming conventions for bicyclic compounds. We think of them as having a bridge of length zero and actually include that in the ring and in the name. And actually include that in the name. Now, how do we go about naming bicyclic compounds? Well, we're gonna do something similar to what we did with acyclic alkanes and cycloalkanes and name the parent chain first, thinking of the bicyclic ring system as the parent chain and then naming substituents using locant numbers and the typical kind of ill suffixes, methyl, ethyl, propyl, etc. So how do we go about naming the parent chain? Well, first, we count the number of carbons. 
and the number of carbons in the full bicyclic system is used as the root name. For example, if we have seven, this is a seven carbon system, that's worth pausing and verifying on your own, it's going to be a heptane. And we append the prefix bicyclo, bicycloheptane in this case, to the start of the name. But between bicyclo and heptane, we're going to have a series of numbers in square brackets with periods separating the numbers. And what these represent are the lengths of the bridges that connect the two bridge head carbons in the bicyclic system. So finding the bridge head carbons is critical. Then we look at the lengths of the bridges. And there are most generally three bridges, right, including potentially a bridge of length zero for a fused ring system. And so we're going to have three numbers in square brackets from largest to smallest, or the longest bridge to the shortest bridge. And then, as we mentioned, we end with the name of the acyclic alkane with the length equal to the total number of carbons in the ring system, for example, heptane here. So let's work through these two examples to see how this works. First things first, count the carbons and identify this as a heptane and identify the bridge head carbons. The bridge head carbons here are the carbons highlighted in orange on either end of these chains that link these two fairly highly substituted carbons together. So the bridgehead carbons are quite often the most highly substituted carbons, and they're linking these chains on either end of the bridged or fused system together. So counting the carbons, we know we're dealing with a bicycloheptane here. And to fill in the square brackets, we count the sizes of each bridge connecting the bridgehead carbons. For example, the longest bridge has three carbons. It goes from here, it starts at this bridgehead, and we don't count the bridgeheads in this count, by the way, and we have one, two, three. It's a three carbon bridge. Next, we have a one carbon bridge here highlighted in blue, not counting those bridgehead carbons in orange. We have just one carbon in this bridge. And then the third bridge is yet another one carbon bridge right here. Of course, we could have done these in reverse order. It doesn't really matter because they're both one carbon bridges. And now to indicate the lengths of these bridge sizes, we put 3.1.1 inside the square brackets. So this would be read as bicyclo 311 heptane. All right, let's move to the second example. Well, here again, we have a heptane, and we can identify the bridge head carbons for looking at those relatively highly substituted carbons that are on either end of these linkers across the ring system. And it's these two carbons right here that are the bridge heads. Now, counting the carbons, we identified this is a bicycloheptane system. And now we want to look at the lengths of the bridges, not counting the bridge head carbons. So we've got a two carbon bridge here highlighted in red. We've got another two carbon bridge here highlighted in blue. Notice one, two, not counting the bridge head carbons. And then we have a one carbon bridge here at the top. And so we have a two, two, one ring system here, bicyclo two, two, one. Heptane. These are actually isomeric with each other, which is interesting to point out. Right? They have the same number of rings. Things are just connected in a slightly different way with different ring sizes. They're both C7H12, but they're isomeric, constitutional isomers connected in different ways. What about substituents? Well, to deal with substituents, we need to number the ring carbons. And here's where things get a little bit esoteric and difficult to deal with. Um, because the numbering convention here is, is highly arbitrary, but it's one that allows us to consistently number the carbons the same way every time, no matter who's looking at the ring system. And the convention here is we start numbering at one of the bridgehead carbons, we proceed along the longest bridge first, and then we hit the next bridgehead carbon, and then we continue along the next longest bridge, and then finally we finish numbering along the shortest bridge, numbering continuously as we go along, avoiding jumping around until we get to the very end where we find often that we, we have to jump over the other bridgehead carbon to name that last bridge if it exists in a bridge ring system. So for example here, we know we're dealing with an octane, eight carbons in the ring system, in the bicyclic ring system. We don't count the methyl for this, so it's a bicyclooctane. And if we do the usual routine of counting, identifying the bridgehead carbons, and then counting the bridge sizes, it's a 3 to 1 octane. Pause and verify that if you need to. And then to deal with the substituent, well, notice how the numbering works here. We start by numbering this carbon 1. This is one of the bridgehead carbons. That's how we know to start there. We go 2, 3, 4, 
five because we numbered contiguously. So now we're at the other bridge head carbon. And now we've got a choice. We could go up here or over here. Because these carbons highlighted in blue are the next longest bridge, we continue this way with six, seven, and then finally the one carbon bridge gets the highest number, carbon eight. And this is where the methyl substituent is located. So this is eight methyl by cyclo three, two, one octane. When multiple bridges have equivalent length, we get into a bit of a mess uh, where we have to decide which bridge to go down to continue the numbering. And the general idea here is to keep the numbers as low as we possibly can when doing this. This can also influence which bridgehead carbon you choose to start numbering at. So here, for example, it's correct to start numbering at this bridgehead carbon in the back. This will end up giving the methyl substituent the number locant number six as opposed to locant number seven if we start numbering here and follow the convention going around the longest bridge first like so. So let's work through this example really quick. It's a cyclooctane, bicyclooctane, eight carbons within the ring system and we see that carbons one and five are the bridgehead carbons and we've got a bridge of length three, a bridge of length two, and a bridge of length one. So it's a three, two, one octane and the numbering proceeds around the three carbon bridge first in red, then we hit the other bridge head carbon, and then we continue along the two carbon bridge. But there are two ways to do this, right? We could start with the front bridge head carbon as carbon one, or the back bridge head carbon as carbon one. And conventionally, we choose to start numbering such that the substituent gets the lowest number possible. That's what makes this incorrect. This would be a seven methyl situation, but we can number such to give that methyl group a smaller number. Six methyl by cyclo three, two, one octane is the name of the compound here. Finally, let's work a couple of examples with substituents attached to bicyclic ring systems. So in this first case, we have a bicyclo octane, and we can see that if we count the carbons in the bicyclic ring system only. There are eight carbons here in this bicyclic ring system. So it's a bicyclo octane. Let's identify the bridgehead carbons, connecting those bridges together on the ends, essentially, um, are the bridgehead carbons. And then let's find the, the bridges. We've got a four carbon bridge here. We've got a two carbon bridge here. And notice this is an example of a fused ring system. The two rings are sharing a bond. And so we consider this a bridge of length that's zero. So this is a four two zero bicyclooctane ring system. Okay, so now how do we think about numbering? Well, we're gonna start at one of the bridge head carbons and proceed around the longest bridge first. And this is an interesting one, right? Where we could start with number one up here, or we could start with number one down here. And the thing that I notice is that if we start with number one down here, we're going to give these two methyl groups a pretty low number because we're gonna proceed along that four carbon bridge going one, two, three, etc. So this is likely to result in the lowest numbers possible. So this is how we're going to think about numbering this thing. Carbon one is this lower bridgehead carbon proceeding kind of clockwise around the longest bridge, getting to the other bridgehead carbon, and then seven and eight. And now we just look for the positions of these methyl substituents and list them at with their locus locant numbers and tetramethyl right, one, two, three, four methyl groups in this thing. And the locant numbers are two and two, five and seven. So this is two, two, five, seven, tetramethyl bicyclo four, two, zero octane. And this is, a, again, a fused ring system. And this is why this bridge of length zero appears in the name. Just keeps things more consistent across different bicyclic systems to lump bridged and fused systems into the same naming convention. Spiro systems, by the way, have an entirely different naming convention that we are not going to touch on in any way, shape, or form in Chem 2311. All right, let's move on to the next example. So here we have a five-membered ring fused to a three-membered ring, and the total number of atoms in the bicyclic ring system is six, the five-membered ring plus one, essentially. And again, we have a fused ring situation. So I've got the two bridgehead carbons here, the carbons on either end of that fusing bond in a fused ring situation. I've got a bridge of length three and a bridge of length one. So this is a bicyclo three, two, a three, one, zero. It's a typo. Hexane. All right. Let me fix that up. Bicyclo 310 hexane going on here. Okay, so now 
how do we think about numbering? Well, again, we've got this situation of choosing which bridge head carbon to start numbering at. And again, the thing I notice here is that this carbon is closer to a substituent on the longer bridge. And so we're gonna start numbering at that bridge head carbon that's closer to the methyl substituent. That's gonna give this methyl substituent number two, this substituent number three, four, five, and six. And now we're done numbering, and all we need to do now is figure out the names of the substituents and their locant numbers and pre-pin those to the name. The substituent at carbon 2 is fairly obvious. That's a methyl group. The substituent at carbon 3 looks a little more exotic. We could name this as a 1-methylpropyl substituent, noticing that this is a 3-carbon propyl group with a methyl substituent at carbon 1. That's one option. We could also notice that this is a butyl chain, 4-carbon chain, linked via its secondary carbon to the parent chain. So this is an example of a sec butyl group, and we could name this as 3-sec butyl. That's actually going to come first because the B in butyl is uh, what's driving the alphabetization here. Bit of a super esoteric conventional thing, but there you go. Now the methyl group is a carbon 2, so we're going to add 2 methyls. So the full name here is 3-sec butyl 2-methyl bicyclo 3-1-0 hexane.